Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we get specific on the dangers we all face from World War II nuclear weapons waste. The first part of this story will be about the waste stored at the Hanford site in southeastern Washington state. We'll be talking with veteran activist Jerry Paulette of Heart of America Northwest. And a nuclear hot seat, you are there report from the front lines of activists out on the streets of North St. Louis protesting the Environmental Protection Agency's handling, or rather non-handling, of the Westlake landfill World War II nuclear weapons waste, as well as the encroaching ground fire that is within 500 yards of intersecting with that waste. Plus, our ever-popular Num Nuts of the Week feature, nuclear reactor duck and cover report, and more honest nuclear information than the Japanese 2020 Tokyo No Olympic Committee is willing to admit to the International Olympic Committee. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, May 17, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Did you ever wonder how Japan managed to land the 2020 Olympics for Tokyo, despite the fact that Fukushima had happened and was still spewing radiation as it does to this day? Well, other people were wondering that too, though, from a different angle. And now, French prosecutors have announced that they have launched an investigation into Tokyo's campaign to host the 2020 Olympics for alleged corruption and money laundering. Prosecutors said a total of 2.8 million Singapore dollars, or 2.04 million dollars in American funds, had been transferred from a Japanese bank to one in Singapore related to Papa Masata Dayak, the son of former International Association of Athletics Federation's president, Lamine Dayak, in July and October of 2013 under the name of Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games bid. Boy, that was smart. Tokyo was awarded the Games in September of 2013 when Dayak was an International Olympic Committee member and known as an influential power broker in that community. A French judicial authority member told reporters how much influence the former president could have had on other committee members will be the focal point of the investigation. Japan's Olympic minister, Toshiaki Endo, said in a TV program he takes pride in Tokyo making a, listen to the wording, clean bid, and denied the allegations, liar, liar, pants on fire. Japan's top government spokesman, Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga, said at a news conference, we understand the campaign for the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games was conducted in a, listen to the wording, clean way. So that's obviously their branding word. They want to make it so it sounds clean. With Fukushima leaking only, what, 149 miles away? We'll be covering this one really closely. Over to the U.S., where our friend at Mining Awareness uncovered a memo that concluded that water will enter the West Texas Radioactive Waste Burial Grounds, Waste Control Specialists, making it unsafe for long-term underground storage of nuclear waste. The intra-office memorandum from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality states that groundwater is likely to intrude into the proposed disposal units and contact waste from either one or both of two water tables near the proposed facility. The applicant has failed to demonstrate compliance with the statute number, which states the disposal site shall provide sufficient depth to the water table so that groundwater, perennial or otherwise, shall not intrude into the waste. There will be some Texas business billionaires who are not going to be happy with that particular memorandum having come to the light. In San Diego, California, 
Former Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi of Japan met for three days with sick U.S. Navy sailors who were irradiated at Fukushima while providing humanitarian aid to Japanese victims of the earthquake and tsunami of March 11, 2011. The former Prime Minister listened attentively to severely ill sailors describe in detail illnesses such as leukemia, cancers, tumors, and other life-threatening health conditions resulting from their exposure to radiation at Fukushima. The class action lawsuit against the Japanese utility, Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, includes more than 400 named injured sailors, a total of 2,400 sailor first responders, and a total of up to 75,000 affected U.S. personnel and their families. Throughout his term as Prime Minister, Mr. Koizumi was a proponent of nuclear power, but in the wake of the Fukushima disaster in 2011, he was one of the first pro-nuclear politicians in Japan to change his conviction to an anti-nuclear position. We'll have more on those sailors next week. Now it's time for the nuclear hot seat nuclear reactor duck <laughs> and cover report. Friday the 13th hit hard at Susquehanna in Pennsylvania, where the Unit 2 reactor was manually scrammed, that's a hard screeching shutdown, by plant operators due to a sustained loss of power to essential plant loads, resulting in a loss of safety function. <laughs> also on Friday the 13th at Riverbend in Louisiana came the discovery that an existing design inadequacy could prevent both trains of the standby gas treatment system from performing its design function, which, by the way, is a safety function. As a result of this condition, both standby gas trains were declared inoperable and thus derailed. <laughs> Friday the 13th came on Sunday the 15th for Byron in Illinois, where an unusual event was declared due to an excessive unidentified leakage during the facility's startup. And realize that there's nothing more usual than an unusual event, which is what they call it at a nuclear facility. In this instance, an excessive unidentified leakage during facility startup set off the reactor vessel flange temperature high leak-off alarm. You never want to hear an alarm in connection with a nuclear facility. <laughs> Also on Sunday the 15th, at Millstone in Connecticut, an unusual event, see how usual they are, due to main generator hydrogen leak in the turbine building. And operators manually tripped the reactor. And that's this week's Nuclear Hot Seat Nuclear Reactor Duck <laughs> and Cover Report. A little bit of good news on the reactor front. The Omaha Public Power District will permanently shut down its nuclear power plant at Fort Calhoun at the end of this year. The utility's president and chief executive, Tim Burke, told the utility's board of directors it no longer makes financial sense to continue operations at Fort Calhoun, which back in 2011 turned into an island when the Missouri River flooded, surrounding it completely, and it had to use an eight foot inflatable berm, which at one point deflated, in order to protect it from being absolutely inundated in what could have turned into a Fukushima-style disaster. It also suffered a fire that same year. The plan is for OPPD to replace it with wind and solar renewables. And an important article on internal exposure concealed, the true state of the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident by Yagasaki Katsuma, has been published in the Asian Pacific Journal, Japan Focus. Since the explosion at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, Katsuma has drawn on his expertise to conduct field research and to support those who evacuated to Okinawa. We'll have a link up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 256. We'll have today's featured interviews in just a moment, but first... Bet you know what I'm about to say. You've got it. Nuclear Hot Seat relies on you, you who are listening to this show, to help us meet our expenses as the program continues to grow, and it is growing. No amount of donation is too small. I understand what it's like to be on a budget, and the gesture, any gesture, any size, will be greatly appreciated. One thing you might like to consider is giving what I call a Starbucks donation. 
the equivalent of what it costs for a cup of coffee plus a tip. It's a great way to get started in supporting this show. You can also make it recurring, buying, so to speak, a cup of coffee a month to help support honest, verifiable news and information about nuclear issues. So let's get our not-to-be-drunk caffeine fix on. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and know that whatever amount you can offer, I'm really happy that you do so. It goes a long way to keep me in good heart, and it does support the running of this show. Thank you. The Hanford site in southeastern Washington state is the most contaminated area in America and one of the most polluted places on earth. But I didn't understand how bad it was until today's interview with Jerry Paulette. Jerry is an attorney and the longtime executive director of Heart of America Northwest, a 16,000 member group which is widely respected as the region's largest citizen watchdog group for the cleanup of Hanford. In addition to his nuclear watchdog, bulldog activist role, Jerry is a Washington State legislator, a faculty member at the University of Washington's School of Public Health, and a frequent commentator on nuclear safety and health issues in national and regional media. Jerry Paulette, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for having me. Let's start with some background so people can understand the magnitude of what we're talking about here. When we say the Hanford site, what are we referring to? Where is it and how did it come into being? The Hanford Nuclear Reservation is a vast area in the middle of the state of Washington alongside the Columbia River where the United States made most of its plutonium for nuclear weapons starting with the first Trinity bomb and the Nagasaki bomb and continuing throughout the Cold War. Making plutonium was incredibly dirty and dangerous and it created vast quantities of radioactive and chemical wastes, most of which our federal government decided should just be dumped into the ground. The most radioactive, high-level liquid nuclear wastes were temporarily, in quotes, stored in massive steel tanks the size of a full city block, four stories high, buried in the ground, many of which have leaked. What, if any, safety culture was there to protect people and or the environment during World War II? During World War II and in the early Cold War, not only wasn't there a safety environment, there was the opposite. Right after World War II ended, the U.S. government decided that it would basically use the people of eastern Washington, eastern Oregon as guinea pigs and deliberately released large quantities of radiation into the air so that it could compare airborne readings with readings over the Soviet Union to find out what it is doing with its nuclear weapons plants. So the people of the Northwest were used as guinea pigs for large-scale radiation experimentation, and the wastes were considered just something that you dumped. And so with very little attention to safety, the workforce was exposed to chemicals and to radiation levels. And the federal government said, don't worry, it's safe. But we now know that federal government at all its weapons plants fabricated safety records about employees and their dose records and kept telling people it was safe even while they saw their fellow workers dying of cancer and they just thought that was normal. All of this is, of course, outrageous. When the war ended, I read that there were as many as 53 million gallons of high-level radioactive waste left on the site and that it was buried in these underground containers you described so well that had either a single wall or a double wall. Do we know, first of all, how thick that metal was and how well it has held up all these years later? 
there are a little less than 200 of these massive underground tanks. Most of them are what we call single shell tanks built from the 1940s through the 1960s. And these were just a few millimeters thick carbon steel tanks because the federal government didn't want to spend money on stainless steel. And carbon steel rotted through. So as early as the 1950s, tanks began leaking. And these tanks with single wall, when they leak, they leak extremely hot radioactive waste. And I mean hot, heated, as well as radioactively hot, would leak under the tank. And under one of the tanks, that caused a steam explosion and a massive leak into the ground. When did that happen? That happened in the mid-1950s, and the Soviet Union had the exact same thing happen, except that their tank, the whole tank exploded, and that caused the massive nuclear disaster around Mayak with hundreds of square kilometers that should have been uninhabitable but the Soviet Union moved people back in, didn't tell them what was happening to them. So in other words, they turned a disaster into an opportunity to do human experiments in radiation exposure. And then it sounds like the United States turned around and a short time later did the exact same thing. Would that be accurate? That would be accurate. In the United States, we actually did it first. <laughs> we were releasing large quantities of radiation and... We knew we were exposing people. I've reviewed declassified documents from right after World War II through the early 50s in which our federal government, for example, said in regard to Native Americans who had treaty rights to live along and fish the Columbia River, let's invite them back, even though they knew full well that the river was highly contaminated and fish were being contaminated and they said, you know, basically for public relations purposes, let's invite them back and let's keep all discussion, all scientific papers, all research relating to contamination of the Columbia River, a top secret, classified military secret. So they knew that there was radioactive material leaking into the Columbia River. How long ago? as early as, from the very first operations of the reactors because the first reactor, B reactor out at Hanford, and the eight more that followed it, all dumped their highly contaminated cooling liquid right back into the Columbia River, except for the final reactor, which dumped it into a massive ditch alongside the river, which then within a few days would go into the river. And so there was a massive load of radiation going into the river from the reactors. Radiation was detectable all the way down to the mouth of the Columbia River and up the coast, for instance, in the oysters. When you say the coast, are you talking about the coast of the Pacific Ocean? Yes, the Washington coast up from the Columbia River in Grays Harbor area. So that was known to be polluted with radionuclides, with radioactive waste from Hanford. That's right. Oh, excuse me. This is, you know, this is tough information. The more I learn about this stuff, the angrier I get. So knowing that there was this degree of radioactive pollution in the ground, in the groundwater, leaking into the Columbia River and getting into the ocean, when did our government start trying to manage the waste in a more responsible way, and what are some of the things that they tried? In the mid-1970s, Congress began passing hazardous waste laws, and the Energy Department, which had taken over from the old Atomic Energy Commission, resisted the application of hazardous waste laws to the nuclear weapons facilities and the, well, excuse me, what was their rationale for that? The federal government wanted to make nuclear weapons as cheap as possible. The whole rationale for nuclear weapons was that it was cheaper to have nuclear weapons to hold the Soviets at bay than it was to have 
uh, massive army and conventional weapons. So making nuclear weapons had to be done as cheaply as possible, as fast as possible, and that meant disregarding the health of the workforce, and it meant disregarding the environmental consequences, and that mindset prevailed and really is still existent in much of the energy department today. But in the 1970s, the energy department fought a last-ditch effort against the new environmental laws that had been adopted, and the U.S. Supreme Court held that hazardous waste laws applied to the energy department in 1976, took until 1989 for the state of Washington and U.S. EPA to force the Energy Department to enter into a 30-year cleanup agreement. That's how long it was only going to take, presumably. That seemed like an entirely outrageously long time from 1989 to clean up Hanford. My organization was new at the time. I was young in my career. And when that agreement was signed and we looked at it, we said, this is an awful deal because the U.S. EPA and the state of Washington had agreed to let the Energy Department continue dumping 2 billion gallons a year of untreated liquid radioactive and chemical wastes straight into the soil while they were promising to clean up Hanford. Everything that has been accomplished for the cleanup of Hanford has been accomplished by citizen public pressure and organizing. We had to go to court as a part of American Northwest. We had to organize public meetings and turn hundreds of people out year after year to stop the federal government from dumping untreated liquid waste into the ground while they were claiming to clean up the ground. Then it took until 2004 to get the federal government to agree to stop dumping radioactive solid wastes straight into unlined ditches, which are leaking today still. So it's been a constant effort of citizen organizing and litigation and lobbying and advocacy to make any progress on the cleanup of Hanford. And we see that continuing with the leaking high-level nuclear waste tanks today where the federal government has said, okay, we admit one of the newer double wall tanks is leaking. But it took us four years to get them to agree to empty that tank. And in the meantime, we know that there are six and possibly seven additional leaking tanks and the federal government is just watching them leak. This is outrageous. What has been tried in terms of cleaning up and how successful or unsuccessful has that been? There have been some good successes. It's actually not rocket science to clean up either chemical or radioactive contaminated soil right next to the Columbia River as long as you dig deep, put it into containers, and then they truck it to the central part of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation into the world's biggest lined landfill and track where it gets disposed. But there are things that are a lot more difficult, such as cleaning up contaminated groundwater that's flowing straight into the Columbia River from these areas, and where the high-level nuclear waste tanks are located about 6 to 10 miles from the Columbia River. They continue to leak. They've leaked for decades, and their contamination is hitting the groundwater and beginning to flow towards the river, and that becomes a lot more complex to try to clean up 15 to 40 feet deep of soil, which has been contaminated from dumping waste straight into the ground or in barrels which corroded away near the river. So there's been a lot of progress in soil cleanup and now the much more difficult task of emptying tanks and solidifying the waste from the tanks, turning it into a glass called vitrification, has not been able to work. 
and the federal government has spent billions and billions of dollars building a treatment plant called vitrification plant that for years critics have said is unlikely to ever work safely the way they're building it and it was supposed to have opened in 2011 then it was supposed to have opened in 2021 and now the federal government and the state of Washington have signed an agreement that it will be fully operational in the year 2035. Before then, a lot more of those tanks are going to be leaking. A stunning information. I know vitrification was also proposed on the Savannah River site and had a similar run of cost overruns and lack of implementation. So that seems like a failed technology or a technology so complex that we're not even going to get a chance to see it, possibly in my lifetime. No, it is a technology that is workable for simpler radioactive wastes or if you want to have simply glassify all the waste from the tanks in big glass logs altogether. The problem is that the federal government, the Energy Department, has tried to do this in a way that I would say deliberately chosen ways to maximize the profits of its contractors, people like the Bechtel Corporation and Westinghouse, and build a vitrification plant based on the idea that they're going to separate all the different chemical and radioactive components in the tanks, which are a witch's brew of different chemicals, and try to reduce as much of the waste as possible that they would send to a deep underground repository and maximize how much of it they would pull out, make into a bigger glass block, and dispose on site at Hanford, where it will then recontaminate the groundwater in over hundreds and thousands of years. If you just simply said, let's pull the waste out of the tanks and make it all into the same glass and one day send it to a deep underground repository, it would have been a lot easier and cheaper than what they're trying to do. But of course, it's the federal government. They're not looking for the most effective way of doing it. I don't even know what they're thinking of. It's the contractor system. So when you've got a company like Bechtel that is essentially paid $690 million a year to design and build this plant, there's an incentive for them to say, okay, we got something wrong. Pay us $690 million a year for another few years to design an even more complicated system might not work. And if it doesn't work, you'll pay us another 10 years' worth of fees. So it's not in the best interest of Bechtel to actually come up with a solution to this. It has not been. They've done very handsomely from all the cost overruns and the fact that they kept building a plant before it was even designed and before anyone had evaluated whether it would work and whether or not it would be safe, and then had to start over again, and start over again, again, and again. Let's shift this a little bit to what the risks are that we're facing, and specifically the health risks and dangers to workers and people who live in the area. What do we know, and what do we suspect? We know that a couple dozen workers have been exposed to vapors coming out of these underground tanks in recent months, several in the last couple of weeks, that the Energy Department has refused to put engineering controls on the emissions from the tanks, and so workers keep getting exposed over and over and over again. I am very critical of the state of Washington, which has regulatory oversight in theory over this under hazardous waste laws, but has refused to use that oversight authority under our hazardous waste laws to protect the health of workers and require air emission 
engineered solutions instead of saying, well, when the tank vents, the workers will wear supplied air. But it turns out that the chain link fence doesn't stop the chemical vapors coming out of the tank yep. from exposing workers thereby. It's, isn't that shocking that a chain link fence doesn't stop that? Amazing. Who would have thought that with all of science behind it? Is there any kind of health registry specifically tracking cancers for the workers or for the people who live in the local community, Richland? For the workforce, President Clinton pushed through Congress a terrific law called the Energy Employee Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act. Really big name. The Secretary of Energy at the time, Bill Richardson, issued a formal apology to the workers at America's nuclear weapons facilities and said, we exposed you to radiation and chemicals and other things like beryllium, which are deadly. And we know that, in fact, you have an elevated, seriously highly elevated rate of certain cancers, and we are going to give you compensation for that if you prove that you worked in certain facilities and had certain exposures. And then over the years, Congress has stepped in and said, in fact, for some exposures, you don't even have to prove that you had a dose of X, Y, or Z. You simply have to show you worked in the facility at this time. And so we know we've got thousands of claims that have been granted and recognized as more likely than not caused by exposure at Hanford and the other nuclear weapons plants. There is no registry, though, for the general public. Again, those exposures stop at the plant border, theoretically. Quote, unquote. The program you're talking about, I believe that Denise Brock has been very involved with helping workers. I know she was certainly involved with Rocky Flats to be able to actually claim the money that is available to them. So at least there's some compensation, though nothing on par with what's needed and the health damage that has been done. Right. So I have friends who are dying of beryllium exposure. You only get it from working in a nuclear weapons plant, a nuclear power fuel facility, or aerospace. And the federal government basically pays them $120,000 to die a horrendous death similar to black lung. It's very sad. But before this program existed, they didn't get anything. They were not getting anything. They were losing their homes for their medical bills, and the federal government fights, and the contractors fought them tooth and nail to say, we didn't cause this. With, at the end of the Clinton administration, the Clinton administration, Secretary of Energy Bill Richardson, said, we're going to stop fighting. We acknowledge we caused this exposure, and we're going to give you compensation. Congress set the compensation at a level which is, frankly, of course, inadequate, but it's sure better than telling people to drop dead, lose their homes while they're dying, and never get any recognition that the federal government caused it. The picture that emerges, of course, is that Hanford is a tremendously dangerous, toxic environment. But just in case we weren't clear on the extent of the catastrophic risks at this site, there are nuclear reactors there involved as well. Tell us about those. Making plutonium is a process where there were nuclear reactors. The fuel came out of the nine nuclear reactors that were there. Excuse me, nine no. nuclear reactors on the site? There are actually more than nine. There are nine major nuclear weapons production reactors, and then the very dangerous old test reactor for plutonium, and then a prototype breeder reactor is there, plus one operating, currently operating, commercial nuclear reactor is there. That's Columbia Generating Station, isn't it? That is the Columbia Generating Station. So today, while most of the talk about Hanford 
is about the contamination that is seeping into the ground and groundwater. For example, the leaking high-level nuclear waste tanks. People have begun to forget that in the event of a rather predictable earthquake, there are massive nuclear facilities that are still sitting there holding in swimming pools vast quantities of radioactive waste. And those pools and the buildings in which they're stored are going to fail in an earthquake. And if that happens, you've got Fukushima redox. So the Columbia Generating Station, the commercial nuclear reactor, which originally was called Whoops 2 for Washington Public Power Supply System, and then it was renamed Columbia Generating Station, it's a cousin to the Fukushima reactors with its spent fuel storage in a swimming pool several stories above the ground, above the reactor, and it was built to withstand an earthquake that is only that is basically two and a half times less powerful than we now know is likely to occur in coming decades. And the federal government and the operator of the reactor says, don't worry, we'll bring in the water supply to keep it cooled in the event of an earthquake. But then there are numerous other facilities at Hanford that are in even worse shape that will also release large amounts of radiation and possibly once their water drops below the level of the fuel, they catch fire, causing catastrophic airborne releases of radiation. And there isn't enough equipment to cool all of them in the event of an earthquake. You wouldn't even be able to get the equipment there because the trucks would have to go past the other facilities that are releasing radiation in order to get from one facility to the other. So Hanford is a potential incredible catastrophe in the event of a earthquake, which we now know is likely to occur in the next coming decades. What can we do? You know, I mean, that's the short version. Is there anything that we as concerned citizens, as the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat, who are already educated and motivated on these issues, can do to support something, anything, that will be of help up there? Well, as I said, we're optimistic citizen activists. So the first thing you do is you you go to HanfordCleanup.org, Heart of American Northwest's website. Follow us and follow us on Facebook and contribute. But we know that we have to empty one of these swimming pools of radioactive waste. And the federal government, the Energy Department, had promised to ask for money from Congress to do it two years ago. This year they said, oh, we didn't ask for the money. So we need people to say, we need to have the money appropriated by Congress to empty the swimming pool of radioactive cesium and strontium at Hanford. We need new double shell tanks built, which the state of Washington is saying it wants built, but the energy department says to Congress, don't give the money to do it. We don't want to build them. We need them because tanks are leaking and you need something to put them in because that vitrification plant isn't going to be operational perhaps ever, but it certainly won't be fully working until the year 2035. So you need new tanks to move waste to right now. And Congress can do that, but it will only do it if people speak up. And then thirdly, groups like Physicians for Social Responsibility and our organization are working to say, time to close down the Columbia Generating Station. It was wrong to give it another 20 years license when we haven't even upgraded it to meet the lessons of Fukushima. It's a cousin to the Fukushima plants and it is dangerous and uneconomic for this region to be running it and creating more waste. So let's, it's time to shut it down and we're asking the public utilities of the region 
publicly owned utilities of the region, which operate it so the voters get to have a say. Let's shut it down. I can only wish you complete fortune and success in this because the picture that comes clear is that Hanford is far more dirty and dangerous than even I was aware of, and I believe so many others are. We tend to think of it as a single thing, but here you are explaining how many different aspects there are to the dangers up there, any one of which would be a nightmare. So, Jerry, thank you for the work that you're doing, that you've been doing for so many years in Washington. Keep us informed of anything that's happening, and I want to thank you for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much, Libby, and thank you for spreading the word about all the facilities like Hanford that are out there. I'd like to say my pleasure. Let's just say it's a place for me to put my bile. That was Jerry Paulette, Executive Director of Heart of America Northwest. You can contact Jerry and the group through their website, HanfordCleanup.org. And in case you're curious, we're going to have a link up on the website to an article about the 10 most radioactive places on Earth, with Hanford weighing in at number 10, and the Russian reactor that Jerry mentioned, Mayak, at number 7. We move next to North St. Louis, where moms, kids, grandparents, and all those interested people who want to see a quality of life continue for the people in that area and are trying to get some resolution with the Environmental Protection Agency about the Westlake landfill with its illegally buried 43,000 tons of World War II nuclear weapons waste, which is highly radioactive that is being borne down upon by a fire, an underground fire that's been burning for five years in the adjacent Bridgeton landfill. And meanwhile, there's a turf battle and a money battle over who's going to clean it up. EPA's had it. They've punted. They have blown it. And the community has spoken repeatedly that they want the Army Corps of Engineers, which is experienced in this kind of cleanup, to take over. The monthly community meeting was scheduled for Monday, May 16th. And two things of note happen. The first is so bad, it qualifies for... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. On Sunday, May 15, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch published a pro-nuke, rah-rah, eh, radiation, no big deal, say experts. And you know how I feel about nuclear, quote-unquote, experts. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch took 18,500 words to try and convince people that there was nothing to worry about. You know, the lady doth protest too much in this one. And they cherry-picked their quote-unquote experts as well. My favorite being David Ropeick, the risk analyst quoted by the Post-Dispatch as downplaying the risks from radiation at Westlake. When the man has been a consultant for the Research Institute for Fragrance Management, and given the stench on the site, that's highly ironic. You cannot make this stuff up. So, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. Picking up where we left off, and this is a more serious aspect of what happened before the Westlake Community Meeting, on the Westlake Landfill Facebook site, somebody, somebody not known to the admins or the community, posted some threats of violence against the EPA. As a result, representatives from three, count them, three federal agencies did not attend the community meeting. The EPA, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, who even knew there was such a thing, and the Army Corps of Engineers, they all canceled out. Hey, troll, good job. You really earned your uptick payment from the nuclear industry for that one. Of course, he has been banned from the site because that's not what that site and those people are about. However, this did not stop the meeting from happening or the activists who protested on the street outside of where the meeting was taking place. 
nuclear hot seat special correspondents Tara Johnson Douglas and Sue Laurel got these interviews and filed this report. I'm asking some questions for the nuclear hot seat show. Want to know why you're here today? I'm here to fight for my community and my own personal interest being a ground zero resident of the Westlake landfill, Bridgeton landfill. And how long have you been involved in this fight? I've been involved since about 2012, 2013. What do you think of the way the EPA is handling this? The EPA is a failure. And it's only compounded because we've seen what they've done in Flint and what they did in Colorado at the, for the Animas River and the Gold King Mine. So why would they treat us any different? They're a fail, fail, fail across the board. Definitely. And what do you want to see happen? We want a safe and permanent solution to Westlake Landfill's radways, preferably complete removal. EPA removed from authority over Westlake and the Army Corps FUSRAP put in charge. And EPA is a joke and our sick and dying are the punchline. Good job. That was Robin Daly here at the protest for Westlake Landfill. Thank you. There's about 14 of us here. They're all different ages. We have a couple young folks in costume. Uh, it is pouring rain. So for us to have 14 people out here in this rain, that is fantastic. Tara, what brings you down here today to protest? I'm here to protest because the EPA has been handling this situation for over 20 years and nothing's been done. They keep lying and we keep dying and we're tired of it. We're fighting back. How did you get involved with Just Moms STL and some of the other groups? Actually, my daughter that lives in Fulton found the groups at Just Moms, the Westlake Landfill, and she sent me to it. And we have a daughter who lives in Maryland Heights. We actually sold her the house, and it's right by the Westlake Landfill. So I'm determined to help these people here and my family and all the people. What group were you here representing? The St. Louis Toxic Aware Group were a new group of some grandmas and moms who want to just help out the Just Moms group of things that they're not able to do. How do you feel about this protest here today, about the people that are out here? There's every age here. Both sexes are here. The young guys, teenagers, college students are here representing the group. There's a lot of grandmas and moms, people who've been sick. We're all here to, to fight the EPA's decisions because they're not doing anything that's helping us. Rita, why are you here today? I'm here primarily because I'm concerned about my grandchildren. Whatever mess we can get cleaned up, they're going to be left with. How do you feel about the EPA's job right now? I feel like the EPA has let us down, it's let this community down, and it's let other communities down worldwide. This last weekend there was a Post-Dispatch article that has a lot of people up in arms. What did you think about that? I think the Post-Dispatch article was very one-sided. Alex, what does this mean to you to be out here with protesters? We're out here protesting because I'm fed up about the failures of the EPA. And it's not okay. They're supposed to be here to protect us and protect the environment. And they've shown no respect to us or dignity and they keep failing to do their job and we're sick of it we're sick of our friends and family getting sick our friends and family dying and not living in fear continuously living in fear and never knowing and never getting answers alex how long have you been involved in the westlake so i've been involved for like um six months to a year now and right when i found out about it i started doing research and found out about just mom's stl and immediately dived in head first and started doing whatever I could to spread awareness and hopefully come to a permanent solution. Do you live in this area? I live in South County, but I grew up in Maryland Heights. So I grew up in North County and I went to school out here and have a bunch of friends and family that still live out here. Jan Huber, I have seen you on Facebook many times and your postings are pretty thoughtful and you're very involved in this. Do you think that there's been any progress made? In many ways, there's been progress made as far as getting the word out. Any action from the EPA? Absolutely no. They have continuously put us off, and here we are, three years later, still fighting to get something done at the landfill. What are you protesting here today? 
I'm actually protesting the EPA and their lack of getting things done and their constant talking and meetings and talking and more meetings while we sit and we wait. We're sick, we're dying, we want a buyout. The signs say things like EPA Region 7 and Republic Services, where's your compassion? No more talk, EPA walk. We are Flint, more EPA lies and failures. EPA, every polluter's ally. Westlake Landfill, toxic to our kids. And then, this is my favorite, Westlake Landfill, be afraid, and it shows a caution sign with radiation signs. I'm here today, I'm representing STL Toxic Aware. We're a splinter group from Just Moms. We're made up of a lot of older people who lived in North County. Myself, I lived in Florissant, grew up near Coldwater Creek. As an adult, I bought a house that backed up to the creek, and I have a daughter who's ill. I firmly believe that it was because of living in that house where the basement flooded. We ate vegetables every year. She's in the grade range of a lot of the people who formed the initial Coldwater Creek group. And so when I moved out of North County, I decided that I wanted to participate in this once I heard about it, and I didn't hear about it for a long time. But about three and a half years ago, my son called me from Little Rock and said, hey, did you hear about what's going on with the graduates from McClure North? And I went to a FUSRAP meeting, and ever since then, I took one year off when I had my daughter, who has leukemia, was ill. But I'm back in, and this time I'm fighting for our Westlake Landfill groups to get that waste turned over to FUSRAP so that it can be removed, have a remedy that works like the rest of the St. Louis sites. George, what brings you here tonight to this protest? To try to help save our community. In what way? In our health, in our lives, in my children's lives, and my grandchildren's futures. When did you first hear about Westlake Landfill? Six years ago. Really? And what do you hope will be accomplished tonight? That the EPA will turn it over to the Army Corps of Engineers and something will finally get done. How do you feel about a voluntary buyout? I think that's a wonderful idea. And who should initiate that? The EPA, of course. They're not compassionate, they just don't care, and I'm just tired of their lies. They just hem hawing around and not getting anything done. There are about 90 to 95 houses that are in a subdivision called Spanish Village, less than a mile from the landfill. You want to tell me about the quality of life that those people have? There is no quality of life. My daughter's best friend has lived there for 14 years, and my daughter has spent many and many a nights there, and they can't open the windows, they can't breathe, they can't live. So they can't do the normal things that families can do? None of the normal things, like breathe. That was a report from the front lines of the Westlake Landfill protest in North St. Louis by Nuclear Hot Seat Special Correspondents Tara Johnson-Douglas and Sue Laurel. Activist shout-out combines with final thought today, and it's not a happy one. It is with great sadness that we acknowledge the passing of Michael Marriott on Monday, May 16. Michael was a more than 30-year veteran of the anti-nuclear movement, as President and Executive Director of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NEARS. Michael was a sweet-hearted, kind, generous, fearless, and tireless worker in the battle against all things nuclear. He was irreplaceable in helping to build our movement, always available to support local work and worn-out activists with his expertise, strategies, and encouragement. Michael was the first activist I met when I set out to produce a little podcast after Fukushima happened. I knew no one in the offline anti-nuclear community when I read a Facebook post about an organizing meeting taking place in San Francisco in August of 2011, the day after the big Muse concert up there. I drove up, slept in my car, and walked into a room filled with at least 80 activists, knowing no one. That's where and when I met Michael, along with so many others. He became a steadfast supporter of Nuclear Hot Seat from its earliest days, 
often granting me last-minute interviews when whoever I had scheduled canceled out. And he always provided information, helping me to grow from ignorance to a semblance of knowing what I'm talking about. Michael had been battling prostate cancer for over three years and far outlived all prognosis before finally succumbing. There's a hole in the heart of the movement today. Nears and Michael's family have asked that if you would like to commemorate his life and work, that you send a donation to the Michael Marriott Legacy Fund. We'll have a link to that up on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com, under this episode, number 256. That's where we'll also post a video showing tributes to Michael from Bonnie Raitt, Graham Nash, and Jackson Brown on the occasion of Michael's Lifetime Achievement Award Ceremony in November of 2014. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, May 10, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, dunrenard.wordpress.com, Kyoto, rt.com, ctvnews.ca, Annals of Nuclear Energy, miningawareness.com, Omaha World Herald, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, stltoday.com, fortnightly.com, apjjf.org, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the sad, sad drones chained to their cubicles writing for World Nuclear News, and the activist community of Nuclear Hot Seat, who gather on our Facebook site, which you are all invited to visit and to like. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, and recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV on StuWebRadioNetwork.com. NewZSentinel.com, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, and now broadcast on FCC Airways at WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. We're always looking for other stations and networks to connect with, so if you know a news aggregator, community radio station that would like to carry the show, let's get in touch. And if you care to binge listen, check out our archive of over 255 shows on the website NuclearHotSeat.com. You can also find us on our YouTube channel, Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes under Podcasts. A reminder that if you go to the site and sign up for the free chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, it's the chapter that talks about being on the ground at Three Mile Island, as a bonus, you will be signed up for a weekly email that carries the link to Nuclear Hot Seat. So you'll never be without that link ever again. Mm-mm-mm. And, of course, a final nudge to remind you that your contributions are what help keep Nuclear Hot Seat, the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.